All right, so uh, this morning I am recording the Introduction to the Prophets uh, lecture for you. So when you get this today, you will have uh, this available in Google Docs. Uh, I'll have a link to it on Blackboard for you, of course. So if you're watching this video, you can download the notes now. Um, you'll also get an announcement uh, telling you what to do with the test. That Remember, the test is due by midnight tonight, which is... Monday, um, make sure I get this right here, Monday, March the 7th. So test is due by midnight tonight, uh, just so you know that. All right, introduction to the prophets. Uh, I have no intention of going through and talking about every single thing on here. What I want to do is hit the high points today um, and make sure that you know what's going on. So <clears throat> this is uh, obviously bolded, uh, former prophets is a term that you're going to want to remember, okay? So you want to remember former prophets. It denotes historical books up to 2 Kings, later prophets or latter prophets, right? That's what we're concerned about in this lecture today. So there's a distinction between former prophets and latter prophets. The latter prophets include the major and the minor prophets. We're going to talk about major prophets being Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then the minor prophets being your um, 12 minor prophets or the book of the 12, which we'll get into later on in the semester. Okay. Now, um, as we talk about dating the prophetic writings, um, it's going to be basically like the way we dated everything else. If they refer to something um, as a historical event, a place name, that sort of thing, then we try to date it according to that. Um, important thing here is this term Nabi, um, which literally is translated in the uh, Old Testament. All the different translations is going to translate that as prophet. It's first applied to Abraham. Now, most of us probably didn't grow up thinking of Abraham as a prophet, but that is the way he's described in Genesis 27. That's chapter 20, verse 7 there. <clears throat> and you'll see the term denotes that it's really a special favorite of God or one who's called by God. Okay? Um, it's not a hereditary office. It's not a political office. It has to do with um, someone who's experienced a call. Okay? Now, let's talk about terms that are translated as seer. Um Oftentimes, prophet or seer is uh, are, are are the way that the prophets, um, and when I say that, the prophets being the people in the Bible known as prophets, like Isaiah, and those sometimes they're called seers also. All right, so Roa and Hosea both mean seer. We're going to focus in on this term Roa. Okay, so um, you're probably going to want to remember Roa as a term for seer okay navi prophet roe seer uh, equated with prophet in second samuel um, they're equally responsible for warning uh, kingdoms the seer is not necessarily called by god okay but they are a uh, person who may divine things such as using the uh, rum and thummim um, Priests could use these sorts of things. They could see what was going on. Now, when we talk about um, prophets or seers um, in Israel, right down here, we're talking about it in the context of the entire ancient Near East. Now, within um, this place right here, which is a city and a kingdom known as Mari, um, also known by the Amorites, uh, around 1800 B.C., uh, there were some tablets that were made that have been discovered uh, that deal with prophecy as well. Now, when you look at this map, you think, okay, that's a long way away from, say, Jerusalem. But you've got to remember that the road structure here would come up from the Nile, up through this area, and then over and across down to Babylon. So there was a lot of trade that went on through this area. And so it's not... Uh, a stretch to say that um, they were a part of the conversation of, you might say, ideas in that area. So Mari, um, they, they had intuitive or ecstatic prophets. 
uh, messages would be written and delivered to an official, right? Um, and they had these diviner prophets who were like seers, and they were often a part of the royal cult. So they might do things like, uh, you know, uh, sacrifice a goat, look at the way that the, um, the goat's liver looked, and if it had a certain kind of spot on it, then it meant this or that or whatever. So that would be kind of the way those things worked, all right? Um, as a part of these wider understanding of cultic um, prophecy, that sort of thing, of prophecy in the ancient Near East, magic was a part of that. Now, I'm not, I, I don't intend to say that magic was a part of the Old Testament prophets here. I'm actually contrasting the idea of magic with what we see in the Bible in the Old Testament. Because magic is a manipulative kind of thing. Um, and that would explain why there's prohibitions in the Bible against engaging in these sorts of things like cultic prostitutions, wearing these things, having tattoos, because it was associated with um, manipulative sort of magic to influence the gods, right? Now, <clears throat> let's also talk here briefly about what Van Gemeren uh, in your textbook describes as religion and revelation. Now, he makes a pretty hard and fast distinction here um, based on reading uh, First and Second Kings especially. I'm not so sure that the distinction is uh, in, in actuality so, so different, but I think in theory, I think from the view of the prophets especially, um, there should be a, a wedge in between these sorts of understandings. So religion basically being what we would call man's way of trying to reach out to God, right, uh, involves this manipulation, divination, and magic, which we've talked about. Um, and then there's these two terms that we haven't discussed yet, but we'll get into in a minute. Uh, Realpolitik uh, and vox populi. Um, again, we'll describe those in a minute. Now, they have sort of a different uh, and corresponding term which is very different different from the idea of revelation this would be God speaking to um, his people in the context of the Old Testament right so instead of manipulation we see people submitting to God instead of um, magic and um, these kind of cultic divination sort of practices we see um, divine guidance and protection right we see God speaking through people um, we, we see uh, divine wisdom as a way of, of uh, conducting politics, as a way of interacting with people, and not realpolitik or power politics, not trying to uh, consolidate power, not uh, making political sort of moves, but instead operating from a divine wisdom perspective. And instead of looking at the will of the people, trying to say, okay, you know, we can maintain our power if we give the people a little bit of what they want. Um, divine revelation in the Old Testament is presented as countercultural. Um, you see prophets going and telling the king uh, to do things that they don't want to do. You see uh, Jeremiah especially being upset that he has to deliver some messages because he knows they won't be received well. So that's going against the will of the people, right? So there's a big distinction there. So as we talk about um, these two sort of ideas, we've got realpolitik, power politics, sort of a way of consolidating, maintaining power. It's manipulative, working at the expense of others. Um, I think of a quote that I, I think I heard off of a Mad About You episode on TV in the late 90s. Uh, I, you know, politics is so political, you know, they, they're trying to consolidate, they're, they're making all these moves to try and make themselves more powerful. Um, whereas the, the Vox Populi uh, is, is related to that, that form. Um, it's understanding what the people are after. Um, it's shunning the absolute demands of revelation by softening the radical nature of faith in favor of popular expectations. <clears throat> that sounds great in theory. What does that mean in practice? And the way that I kind of came up with that to describe it is, um, I mean, I'm going to use examples from both parties, okay? Political parties. So let's say that um, that in the uh, debates, when when people are asked about um, 
you know, what is the, 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 the greatest issue facing the nation? Um, well, r- neither Republicans or Democrats are going to uh, give what they actually think is the greatest issue facing the nation. They're going to frame it in terms of what they think will get them the most votes, what appeals to the people, right? And so uh, they may say it's the economy, stupid, or they may talk about the need for um, certain types of of defense structures that uh, appeal to uh, people's needs, uh, felt needs, and that's where it's um, it's abs- it's actually not addressing the the radical nature of faith. In other words, in our context, it would be what God desires. Um, they're actually softening that by trying to frame it in ways that they think the people would respond favorably to. So that is uh, one of the ways that prophecy occurs in um, the Mari tablets and that sort of thing. You're thinking, what does this have to do with Old Testament stuff? It's going to come back into play later, okay? So just hang with that right now. So when we talk about in our textbook, Van Gameren, who is a prophet, he lists several different features which uh, define a prophet. I'm not going to go through all of these. You've got them right there. Just know that this is a list that you're going to want to remember, right? Uh, these are important. Um, you're going to see these pop up when we talk about um, characters who are prophets. <clears throat> now, when we talk about Samuel, um, he is sort of the role model for prophets. Um, he is not the king. He, he presents God's word to the king. Um, he, you might call him an intermediator uh, or a mediator, I'm a little sleepy still, a mediator between the king and God. Um, So you see him, and then you see, uh, and these are before the former and latter prophets, right? These are uh, historical prophet books. Okay, so Moses has been called the fountainhead of prophecy, which we don't really think about Moses as a prophet, but biblically, he's considered a prophet. And then Samuel uh, is kind of the action uh, where we get the all the examples of what a prophet does, uh, and then Elijah kind of shapes um, what a prophet is going to act like and do later on. We see a lot of those examples in Samuel. Elijah kind of uh, presents um, the lifestyle that they're going to follow. Okay. Now. Um, these are some questions that you're going to want to be able to answer. Um, I think I've said enough about that. Be sure you can answer those questions. Now let's talk about this idea of cultic prophecy in, in ancient Israel. Cultic prophets are different than what many of you and I would understand as a biblical prophet. Okay, A cultic prophet is someone who is tied to a particular location, a particular shrine. So... Um, they would be at a at a location. Um, I'm trying to think. Y- you kind of see this sort of idea with um, the prophets of Baal and Elijah when they when they have their great contest, right? So, with this contest, you have all these people who seem to be tied to a cultic locale, um, which would be the capital of the Northern Kingdom. And so they're a part of this shrine that Jezebel has, has kind of set up in worship there. And like I said before, more popular voices than reform voices. So some have said, yes, we see cultic prophecy in Israel. Um, I think it's a stretch, and I kind of give some reasons for that in the notes um, with some evidence in the text there. Um so that's kind of what I think about cultic prophets. I don't really see them in the Old Testament. Um, we do have these writing prophets, though, right? And the writing prophets frequently condemn cultic worship or cult worship at certain locales. Um, <clears throat> they don't flatly reject any sanctuary worship, but um, they do talk about moral and ceremonial law being met at the same time. Okay. And they, they seem to appeal to this idea, um, which we find in 1 Samuel fifteen twenty two, where King Saul is rejected. He's rejected because he did not 
follow the word of the Lord. And it's not sacrifices, even though he carried out the sacrifice or whatever, but it's following God's word, which is supposed to be the way of worshiping. So we see uh, these different ideas of what a writing prophet is. Um, okay, we see Deborah called a prophetess. Um, Hulda, no idea. Um, Isaiah's wife. But other than those, we don't really hear anything about a prophetess, um, a woman prophet in Israel. Okay. Now they are related to other groups. Um, in other words, they didn't just talk amongst themselves. They interacted with the political elite, the military elite, that sort of thing. Um, you see that through throughout the Old Testament. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip down here. All right. So... When prophets talk about the word of the Lord came to me saying, they're, they're prefacing their message by calling it divine revelation, right? And so false prophecies are considered to be the result of a lying spirit. Um, <clears throat> that's just kind of, in a nutshell, what's going on. Now, uh, when we talk about studying prophetic books in academics, um, you know, first there's the idea of let's just study these people as um, historical figures. And so that was kind of the first uh, vein of scholarship, if you will. And then um, you had um, in the 1800s um, kind of a, a distinction between the, the actual experience of, of, of getting the prophecy from God and then writing it down later on. And so people started to, scholars specifically, started to try and, and draw a distinction between the actual revelatory experience between the prophet and God and then the, um, the writing down or the, the promulgation of that prophecy, right? Um, so that is how this started to be described. <clears throat> so because we know from the text that prophets were introspective and had special perception, they received inspiration through dreams and visions, which could be perverted through alcohol, according to the text. Some have suggested that some sort of hypnosis, hallucin hallucination, some sort of uh, ecstasy along the lines of what you see in, in other cultic uh, texts, prophetic texts, such as the uh, Sibylline Oracles are an um, extra-biblical um, representation of, of prophecy in that sort of way. Um, <clears throat> so basically, um, there were these two scholars here um, who talk about events happening at Melito or Sardis around 180 AD, much later than Israelite prophecy. Um, and so they, they, they study these and they compare the prophetic personalities. And so that's kind of the first wave of separating the experience there, what we might call psychology. But modern psychology, of course, begins with Freud. And Freud and uh, his great debater uh, here, Jung, um, their work was applied to studies of the prophets. Now, this is like around the Civil War in America and later. So Texas is already... Uh, Let's see, first a country, then a state later on, um, kind of when this hit the heyday, right? So historical criticisms on the rise, um, doubts about actually knowing anything real about the prophet, because remember, they're thinking uh, this is all not, this biblical text in, in historical critics' mind uh, at this point was not a reliable uh, historical text. And so it was a small leap to say, well, you know, we can find meaning in them through doing psychological studies. But the problem is that the psychological studies don't really have a lot to do with the text, right? They're trying to get at something behind the text, something in the mind of, specifically an experience in the mind of an author. <clears throat> 
which is not really expressed in the text. So there's a lot of conjecture going on here. And that's why I don't really see this as a viable path forward in studying prophecy. Because for them the word, for, for these prophets, the word of God wasn't authoritative necessarily because of what they saw. Hang on just a second. So, you have this this sort of thing going on. Um interrupted by my janitor there <laughs> but so that's what's going on there now um you have elisha who does have the ability to discern content of plans made in secrecy and you have this foretelling of of uh the birth of josiah so you see some some instances which we would say you know might have some sort of psychological component to them but uh that's a little different than than I think the modern psychological study of things. So let's talk about the next major sort of idea, which is foretelling versus forth telling. They sound very similar. In actuality, a very different sort of thing. So the question is, is there in the, in the prophets, do the prophets actually have an ability to see the future or are they merely um, using historical events to preach God's truth. Um, it started historically with Graf Wellhausen. Uh, however, when you when you look way back in the Church Fathers, you see Augustine um, and others. So this is historical Christianity understood the prophets to be describing what was going to happen in the future because it was already determined. So in other words, it's tied to sort of an understanding of of history and understanding of fate and understanding of God's knowledge of things. And remember, when once you, you, you take away the understanding of miraculous sort of divine intervention <clears throat> as uh, started to happen during and before Graf Wellhausen, then it opens up all sorts of uh, possibilities uh, for understanding things from a human perspective without necessarily seeing divine intervention there so <clears throat> it is interesting to note that in ancient near eastern culture the 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 norm was not forth telling it wasn't that prophets looked back in history and preached truth it was that the prophets could actually foretell events so i think that's an important distinction for us to make why am i belaboring this point it's because foretelling um, <clears throat> works from a understanding of divine inspiration in the text forth telling works from a very different sort of understanding um, one of the figures that I like to talk about with forth telling in scholarship would be someone like Walter Brueggemann uh, this is a guy I've met at professional meetings well-known uh, Old Testament scholar retired now he wrote um, some influential books like prophetic imagination um, even this introduction to the Old Testament which I've incorporated a little bit into our notes but his his um, presuppositions are very different than ours as you'll see here so when he writes this book about the prophetic imagination what he's talking about is this idea of forth telling that the prophet is looking back in history um, trying to tell God's truth about um, what has happened and what will um, will happen. Not in, not in terms of will happen in historical events, but in terms of um, what are some general truths that we can draw from that and um, preach in the future. So he's kind of kind of saying that the prophets in the Old Testament functioned a lot like pastors and preachers in the current sense functioned. In other words, we don't necessarily want to stand up and say, you know, the Lord told me this will be the next president, blah, blah, blah. You know, we don't, we don't do that. Uh, we tend to say that, um, you know, th throughout the Bible, God has his hand in history, so God will not be surprised by who becomes the president. We, we preach those sorts of things. He puts that idea back into the text and says that... Uh, that the prophets were doing this as a way to gain influence and power and shape the political nature of their 
context, uh, the social context that they lived in. So I, I see that as very different than the biblical picture of a prophet, um, especially from the ancient Near Eastern perspective. They really thought prophets could foretell events. And so I think we should read the Old Testament in that same sense. So when we talk about um, literary criticism of the prophets, uh, a lot of this is going to be done um, from, a lot of what you'll read is going to be done from the perspective that these prophets were, were preaching um, general truths from past events, that they were not giving revelation of future events, right? So when you do that, you automatically look at them and say, okay, they're describing, say, events that happen um, with the overthrow of, for an example, the overthrow of the northern kingdom in 722 by Assyria. Since they're prophesying that that would happen in the future, a literary critical understanding, which is working from forthtelling and not foretelling, says the prophet can't actually know the future, so the prophet was later than 722 BC. It was after it had already happened. He wrote, describing the history, making an assertion that it would happen, even though everyone already knew it had happened, trying to preach general truths. So it's, it's a very different perspective. The prophets weren't telling the future. Okay. So um, that is not my perspective. I think they were telling the future, but this is how a lot of modern scholarship works. <clears throat> Now, when uh, modern criticism of prophetic book writing, this is sort of how they think things came together. In other words, prophet makes a statement. It's preserved orally by the hearers, written down. Then it was edited and arranged and collected. And honestly, you know, that sounds good. Where the debate would be and where um, conservatives oftentimes get upset at those and start saying people are liberal is when they want to stretch this into a very long period of time, right? So not very many people are going to have a problem if you say that a prophet preached, um, people heard, and that it was written down during the ministry or immediately after the death of the prophet, and uh, that those people who wrote it down, you know, such as uh, Jeremiah's scribe, right, um, arranged it and collected it. Well, we're not going to really get too upset if you have that really close to the actual events. The problem is when you want to stretch this into 100 or 200 or more than a couple hundred years is when people, conservatives especially, start having a problem with that. Okay? Possible weaknesses um, are that um, Zechariah and others seem to have been purely literary. In other words, it doesn't seem that they really preached this and then it got written down. It seems that they wrote it down. So that process here would have been cut short. Uh, there wouldn't have been steps 1A, 1B, that sort of thing. Um, and so we've talked about this before. They're assuming that prophets were surrounded by a school of disciples. And there doesn't seem to be real good evidence for that, okay? So just know that those things are happening. Um I'm going to leave that one alone. You can read about words of the prophets. Um, let's just hit this. Chicago Statement of Inerrancy, which I have signed. Your teachers at Southwestern have signed. Uh, deal with the original autographs. And so you have to work out um, what that exactly means. People are really getting after me this morning. Um, so you have prophets and canon, um, these kinds of things four roles of prophets so you have the three major prophets three scrolls for the major prophets I should say and you have one for the minor prophets you have um, this idea of scribes and editors very very important point that writing flourished after the 8th century BC so around the time of the overthrow of the northern kingdom in 722 BC writing is becoming um, widespread Okay, uh, before that, not that widespread. Um, perhaps uh, we, we see a picture of where prophecy really ended and became more exegetical, uh, tending toward the preaching that we see in the New Testament. Um, 
three types of prophetic speech. Again, these are something you're going to want to remember. Vestermans, three types of prophetic speech. There's accounts, like historical narratives, there's prophetic speeches, and there are these utterances of prayer or man to God. Okay? Um, broadly speaking, there's several different types, which I've listed many examples from. Intertestamental times um, had people known as prophets as well that were not preserved in the Old Testament. Um, and so these were some understanding during the Greco-Roman times about what prophets were, okay, based on the writings of Barton. A prophet is someone who might understand how predictions in Scripture applied to present times. So you see the shift is to understanding Scripture, not being told the Word of God. Um, so that uh, you have someone like uh, the teacher of righteousness at Qumran who might be understood as a prophet because they can rightly interpret Scripture. Okay? So that's kind of how that works. Uh, eventually, um, some think prophecy turned into a sort of apocalypticism um, and basically what we're just going to do is say that that has to do with end times okay I'm not going to dwell too much on that we'll talk more about apocalyptic writings when we get to Daniel okay but that's basically what I wanted to talk to you about today with um, this lecture those are some things that you need to remember all right